Welcome to another episode of the podcast here on Believe, the number one podcast network for professionals. Do you believe? If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and rate the show. It's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also find it on Believe.com and at Believe Podcast. Follow me on Twitter and post news at Steve Berkowitz and on Instagram and threads at Steve M. Berkowitz. If you're interested in advertising on the show, please contact Believe at Believe.com. All right, let's get started. Before I bring out my guest, I want to talk a little bit about the chaos that is going on in the entertainment industry right now. Of course, I'm talking about the writer's strike, the actor's strike, and the slump in jobs for reality television. Let's just start off with some of the headlines that we've seen over the past couple weeks. How about this one? Peak TV has peaked from exhausted talent to massive losses. The writer's strike magnifies an industry in freefall. Ouch. The binge purge. The TV streaming model is broken and it's also not going away. Painful. There's another one. Hollywood Studios WGA strike. Endgame is to let writers go broke before resuming talks in the fall. That is, that is rough. All right, here, here's one. Uh, this is a survey. Survey. TikTok is the most entertaining media brand for adults under 30. Damn. Uh, here's one. Legacy media companies enter dark times as failures mount and Netflix rises again. Yeah. That, yes. Uh, 25% layoffs at Paramount Global, 7,000 layoffs at Disney, and good old Netflix, 5.9 million new subscribers. It's a tough one. All right, last headline here. Reality TV producers are torn over the Hollywood strikes. That was a Rolling Stone article there where they talked to a handful of reality TV producers. It was pretty good. Um, only one of the producers went on record which is interesting. To me, uh, nobody's really that torn on the strike if you're a reality TV producer. We support the writers, we support the actors. Um, anyway, if you love great scripted television, if you love movies, then you want them to get back to work. Now, you may argue, and I would say that they're never gonna get everything that they're asking for. They're never going to get the same amount of writers that they used to have in the rooms when they had 22 episode seasons. You're just never going to go back to that system. But, you know, hopefully they get the pay raises that they're asking for. They can get some AI rules in place in these contracts and they can get some assurances that there's some stability in the jobs. You know, we, and this is something that was brought up in the Rolling Stone article, we in reality television have no stability, at least with the, within the producers. We have no union protection. Uh, we have no benefits, um, no overtime, no minimum rate, uh, no workplace protection. No one's complaining. It's just, that's the facts. We never created a union. We never joined a union. And because of that, you know, we're not getting any residuals um, and we're not getting any health care. And that's all on us as individuals to take care of. So I think when, you know, this, are, this was a big point in the article, you know, and, and when we see these folks, writers and actors who are striking, that's just something that, that comes up with us, which is, you know, should we be more proactive in terms of asking for these things? But it's a really hard subject. It's really hard to talk to other people about because we're so far down the road here. You know, it, it was something we should have asked for from the get-go, but nobody knew. No one knew what this was going to be. Nobody knew this was going to be a big deal that in 20 years or 25 years, or in the case of the real world, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, that was 1992. So I don't think anybody knew this was going to be a big deal and, and that this would be something we'd all be, you know, making a living off of. Getting back to some of the other headlines, um, I feel like it's important to talk about the business model of streaming um, because a lot of folks who aren't in the industry people have asked me like why is this happening what is wrong like what what is going on and i just I, and this has been well 
you know, folks like Matt Bellany um, at uh, The Ringer, you know, has got a great podcast called The Town um, over on Spotify. And he writes for Puck, has, you know, done a really good job documenting this. And Lucas Shaw over at Bloomberg has broken this down. There's a lot of people. And Scott Galloway has talked a lot about this as well. But the streaming model is broken because it was never really going to work. The math just doesn't add up. So just because streaming works for Netflix, which, you know, was built on growth of subscribers and buying enormous amounts of global content over the course of 15 years to get to profitability. That's right. It just became profitable. Okay. That does not necessarily mean it would work for Disney or Warner Brothers Discovery or Paramount Global or Sony or Fox. It doesn't mean that it works for everybody. And I don't know who it was that was like, oh my God, Netflix, they're making all this, you know, Netflix is making money and their valuation is so high and they're, you know, and all the investors love them. We've got to get into this too. But whoever did that has fucked everything up. It's like fucking jumping into the, into the swimming pool and then realizing that it's not 10 feet deep and that you're all just landing boom, boom, boom into the, the shallow end because they all thought they were jumping into a big pool of money. And the reality is that pool of money's gone. Netflix has had a fucking 15 year head start taking all the subscribers. I mean, shit, you can only subscribe for how many to how many of these uh, services. And then when you talk about the strikes, I mean, shit, they just got 5.9 million subscribers, new subscribers last quarter. That's during the strikes. Okay, so they're getting content out of South Korea. They've got they've got shows being filmed all over the world. They've got libraries of content. They don't need new content. They're saving money. They're cash positive. They're doing stock buybacks. They're now losing the, those big fat overalls to people like Ryan Murphy. They're loving this, man. Apple and Amazon shouldn't even be included in that conversation either and so when you know you look at why there's so much struggle in terms of these negotiations and people are saying well this is the this is the strike that's about streaming well okay but you're never going to get anything resolved if you're trying to negotiate about netflix but you you've got disney and paramount and you know uh you know, Disney, you know, Disney, so ABC and Paramount, you know, CBS and Fox is in there, right? And uh, and NBC, Comcast, I keep forgetting Comcast, you know, for NBC, Comcast is in there, right? They all have different priorities. You've got the big four who need to get programs on the air in the fall, or at least, you know, in the winter, in the spring, they've got 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. slots that they want to fill. They got late night, they got Saturday Night Live. They've got, they want programs that they can then have advertising for live sports, you know, uh, Sunday night football for the NFL. They want to be able to promote that, right? College football on ABC, CBS, and Fox. They've got, they want to be able to promote college football and vice versa. They want to be able to promote their new shows during college football and during the NFL. CBS has the NFL. So all this stuff, they need that programming. And so those priorities are so radically different than Netflix, Amazon, and Apple. Apple makes iPhones and iPads and MacBooks and watches. And like now they got headgear. They don't have to, they don't care about content. They can spend as much as they want. They can make foundation and silo and see they can make they can spend millions and millions of dollars on content and not care and so they're not in any rush to settle any sort of deal with anybody and amazon i mean we know they got they got grocery money they got toilet toilet paper money and uh electronics money and they they don't give a shit either they can spend they can go way over budget on the citadel or that horrible lord of the rings spinoff i mean yeah they, they, there'll be a, an article written here or there but at the end of the day, no. And Netflix is not in that boat. They can't keep spending. They've been they've had to pull back, right? 
They lost subscribers last year at one point, but their stock is way back up. Cracked down on, on passwords. They had some layoffs. They're finally profitable. Their number one show last week was Suits. For God's sake, the show has been off the air for several years. It was a very, very kind of average cut and dry legal kind of buddy comedy drama on USA that Meghan Markle just happened to be in, right? And that show is like number one on Netflix. So if you can just recycle a show like that, that really it wasn't even like the number one show on USA when it was there. And now it's number one on Netflix. Why do you need to spend tons of money for new content? So... Yeah, they're they're set, you know. Um, so I, it's a big fear for me in terms of how long this is going to go. Because those three, if they could separate them and just deal with uh, the, the 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 legacy studios and networks who really want to get content on the air in the fall, who who have priorities um, of actually making content, those people, I think you could get a deal done pretty quickly. But those other three, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. And that's sad. All right, I'm going to bring out my guest really quickly. But uh, before, before I, I bring out the guest, I just want to, one more thing has been kind of bugging me. And that's, I, I keep reading different journalists saying that the, the 2008 writer strike fueled the rise of reality TV, right? And um, that's just not true. <laughs> Like it's just flat out not true. Um, and so please stop saying that. Prior to 2008, we had uh, Cops, we had The Real World, we had Survivor, we had Big Brother, Amazing Race, American Idol, America's Next Top Model, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, Punked, Laguna Beach, The Apprentice, The Hills, The Real Housewives of Orange County, and even Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Those are just a few of the shows that we had prior to 2008. Okay, enough of all of that. Let's get to the interview. My guest is Billy Rainey, a fantastic executive producer, creative executive, and director who thrives in the hidden camera prank genre. He served as one of the big creative visionaries behind the legendary MTV series Punked. He also worked on The Real World and Sidejinks, as well as a wide variety of other projects. And he's done commercials. He's done big, huge campaigns for Twitch, as well as for Netflix. This guy is a, a legend in our industry, and um, I'm really honored to talk to him. Billy is uh, super talented, and I really hope you'll enjoy this interview because we talked about a little bit of everything from going behind the scenes on what it was like to prank some huge celebrities on Punk to everything that's going on in the industry today. And Billy has a very unique take on that. And I think you're going to enjoy this. Dude, thank you for doing the show. I'm excited to chat with you. You've done so much. First off, I want to talk about Punk. You did many, many seasons of, you know, one of the greatest prank shows ever. Well, thank so, you. Uh, yeah, let's, talk to me a little bit about Punk. Sure. I, I speak in cliches, but you know, there's that classic expression of a uh, Success has many fathers and failures an orphan. So, you know, Punk did have many, you know, there was, it was myself, Ashton and Jason. And the way to get into it, what had happened was I was in an overall deal with MTV back when there were still studios and networks were giving out overall deals. And I'd landed, a, you know, into an overall deal there, having created a show called Making the Video. Um, in a previous life, I had worked on the reboot of Candid Camera, and the person who was running the network at the time, or the music development department at MTV at the time, uh, Lois Curran, had said, I know you do comedy also, and you had worked on Candid Camera, like on the reboot. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, so Ashton and his partner have an idea, and we'd like, you know, would you meet with them about it? And I was like, yeah, Sure. So I was handed a piece of paper that, um, you know, one, a just a one, you know, a piece of paper with two paragraphs on it. And the top yeah. of it said harassment. And it was spelled incorrectly, <laughs> not, an iron, not in an ironic way, but just a somebody didn't proofread or spell check this document. You know, so I went over, met with Ashton and Jason. And we all sat around talking and read through this treatment for this show. 
for people who don't. So we're talking about Ashton Kutcher and Jason Goldberg yes. at the time, right? This was at Catalyst, correct? Uh, they were forming Catalyst, but the show was done through MTV. Like MTV was okay. the, the production company of record on it. And then everybody got the the vanity cards at the end of their shows, which we can get into later, <laughs> later on down the road with the vanity credits. But um, anyway, so they, you know, they, you know, went and met with these guys and the, the premise for the show was celebrities playing pranks on regular people. And it was sort of supposed to be essentially Mr. Show was the, that was their take for it. And, you know, Mr. Show for people that don't remember, it's probably the greatest sketch comedy show ever with Dave Cross, Bob Odenkirk. And each half hour show had a theme that ran through it and characters that would appear in one sketch would pop up in another and that story would get paid off at the end. So their idea was to do, again, a show with celebrities playing pranks on real people. You know, that was that. Uh, they want, you know, so we, MTV was like, yeah, let's just do this. We'll do it. Great. You know. Um, so I assembled a team of writers, assembled, assembled a team, and we sort of started digging in on it. And we landed on shooting the pilot in Vegas. And sort of throughout that, you know, again, Ashton really wanted to do this celebrities playing pranks on real people. I had said to him and Jason, I'm like, the killer app is us fucking with the celebrities. I mean, that's the show, you know, that should be the show. And so we went out to Vegas and we essentially shot what came to be two pilots, one celebrities pranking real people. And the second one, us pranking celebrities. So the funny part was <laughs> we were out in Vegas. We're at a uh, unnamed hotel that has a lot of bit of, a lot of rock and roll if Fermia, Ferma, whatever, hanging out in their thing. You can figure out what hotel that is. And we're doing this, this prank where um, real people check into the hotel and they get upgraded into a suite. And they show up in their suite. And lo and behold, there's a dead prostitute on the floor uh, of the hotel room. People don't have a good reaction to it or do have a good reaction to it. Um, you know, because they've been upgraded to this amazing suite and it's just like, oh, just hang on. We'll clean up this mess, blah, 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 blah. That was how the sketch was supposed to go. We shot it a couple of times and every time everybody walked in and just called bullshit on it, they were just like, uh, no, this isn't real. So, um, you know, Jason Ashton's partner was like, I'll go down to the lobby. I'm going to find us the perfect marks, uh, marks and hidden camera. The people were playing the pranks on. So Jason goes down to the lobby selects this older couple who, you know, at that point, older is 30, 35 or what have you. Uh, they show up, they get upgraded to the suite. They come up, uh, they check into the suite, uh, walk in, discover the <laughs> dead body on the floor and uh, just freak out. The one of them just has a just, just worst reaction ever. I'm sitting in the control room with Ashton, who's you know, we'd built out this hotel room to shoot multiple stuff. He's there in a uh, pair of chaps, tidy whities like a vest, cowboy hat on. And I'm just like, you know, for the dress for the next sketch, I'm just like, dude, you got to go in and tell these people what's up and reveal to them like that it's just a joke and everything's fine. He's like, oh, okay. So he goes in, <laughs> reveals it to them. And um, they didn't have the greatest reaction. They're like, you know what? Maybe we'll feel a little bit better about this later. We just don't want to be here right now. We don't feel comfortable. Cool. So we move them to a different hotel. Uh, we learn in that process, they both happen to be attorneys from a very, very famous DC oh. law firm. Uh, and oh. you couldn't pick, I mean, truly both attorneys both, I, want, I don't want to say they saw dollar signs, whatever it is. I'm sitting there. I had just had my son. I'm watching my career in my mind wow. just implode and just, you know, like, fuck. So we call up the president of the network and we're like, dude, what do we do here? And, you know. So is this, is this Doug Herzog at the time? Uh, no, this is Brian Graydon. Brian um, Graydon. Oh, Brian Graydon. Okay. Yeah. So we call up Brian and Brian in his infinite wisdom, wisdom is like, get Ari on the phone and cut a deal right now. And for those that are think, you know, watch a lot of Entourage. Yeah, there's an Ari on Entourage. 
Ariane Entourage is based on Ari Emanuel, who at that time was just the head of Endeavor and was also still Ashton's agent. So um, we, you know, again, we've not, we've just shot the thing. We haven't even edited a single episode yet, haven't done anything. And um, <laughs> Brian's like, just cut a deal. You know, Ashton's feeling bad, get a deal done. And we're like, ah, okay, cool. So long story short, we end up, Ashton ends up, like Ari ends up talking Ashton into, locks him into 65 episodes of this show that we haven't even edited. We haven't even finished shooting the pilot for yet. And that's sort of how he ended up becoming the, you know, the host and being on camera for the first 65 episodes that we did. You know, and we also had shot at that point, as you know, as I mentioned, sort of the two pilots, one with the real people, you know, the celebrities playing the pranks on the real people. And then the other one, us playing, you know, the pranks on the celebrities. We get back, we edit it, you know, everybody's like, yes, that is the show, the select, you know, us fucking with celebrities or messing with celebrities. And so that sort of is, that's what the show, you know, became and grew into. From there, we did the six, you know, all 65 episodes of that. And I mean, it was funny just watching it go from, you know, the first, the first episode that, or the first gag that we shot once we went into series was the Justin Timberlake, us taking Justin Timberlake's house, which to me is still one of my just all time favorite things we did. And because of having done making the video, we did 10 at least 10 episodes of that with in sync and with Justin. So we knew or I knew everybody in Justin's world. And by that it was just sort of we created this stack of documents that were, you know, bulletproof of this person at the label signed for this when we sent you this form. This person did this and it's all these people that you wouldn't be able to know we're associated with him and via Google and, you know, or just, you, you wouldn't know these things unless it was real, you know, damn, we, we took his house and he believed it. And it was one of the most fun things. And it was just funny because, you know, like the things that sold it to where we were I'm not trying to get in the weeds on it, but it was just, he was so somebody gave him an acoustic guitar and he wrote his first solo album on the acoustic guitar. I was over at his house scouting, you know, without, you know, there. And I'm like, Oh, somebody go to guitar center, buy that exact guitar. So we found a perfect dupe of his guitar and just destroyed the, you know, the IRS agents destroyed his guitar and just sort of all these, you know, things that you can buy a new, whatever you can get a new car, but like a musical instrument like that, you can't get another one. You can't have that same experience with it. We, uh, you know, and the thing he really reacted about was when we were like, we, you know, his dogs, <laughs> like telling him that we had taken his dogs and his dogs were going to be in a, a federal penitentiary until the tax bill was like solved or levied or, uh, you know, any of that. While this is all happening, we end up getting um, the suit, the lawsuit back from these two attorneys who had a very bad experience. And um, we got sued for $120 million. $120 million uh, for intentional infliction of emotional distress, violating federal wiretapping laws. I mean, it was just this litany of everything you could think of came in this lawsuit. And I'm just like, oh man, my career is over at this point. Like, I don't, you know, again, I'm like, you know, I'm just thinking I'm done, et cetera. Uh, I get deposed, my hard drive, my computer gets confiscated. Um, which was would be the second time my computer got taken when I was at MTV. The first time was during the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson's boobs. That's another story entirely. Yeah, $120 million. And I'm just like, I don't have $120 million. I don't have $120 at this point. Like, what am I, you know, what are we going to do here? It keeps the lawsuit. Were you, were you specific, who was named in the suit? Was it just MTV and Ashton? Or were you actually named? I mean, it was all yeah, of you. It was everybody. Yeah. I mean, it was, and I mean, you know, you know, and we got coached really well by, I mean, Viacom had great lawyers. I mean, we had really great lawyers and, uh, you know, I mean, I was, you know, deposed. We all were deposed. Um, but it ended up settling out of court for, as I recall, it was 
it was either four or six million, which when you think about it, yeah, that's a lot of money. At the same time, it really wasn't when you <laughs> divide it by 65 episodes, which is what the order was, it ended up being about 60, 60 or $65,000 additional cost on each episode. And the reality of it was that got Ashton attached to all of them. So it was kind of money really well spent. You know, they took the, I mean, it was funny. They took the, uh, you know, we got, when they got deposed and in discovery, they took the pilot. Um, at that point, the pilot was still called harassment. You know, it said harassment on the, you know, on the, title on the on the pilot and on all the documents for it and you know their their lawyers were like clearly you were you know setting out to harass people it was like no it's not even spelled correctly <laughs> like it's, that, that's the lesson divide calling it untitled prank show right yeah so you know so anyway um that was sort of the origin of it so I look I'm not gonna sit I don't want to say I was the sole creator of it you know I was the person that was there where it was just like, okay, here's this idea here, you know, here's an idea that they want to do. It's a hidden camera show in the, you know, in this space, here you are, you're bringing celebrities to it. What am, what am I bringing to the mix? Let's do this to the celebrities. Let's flip it. And, you know, and ultimately that's why it worked, I think, because, you know, I think the audience really wanted to see celebrities dealing with the same stuff they have to deal with on a daily basis, be it parking tickets, being your car getting towed, be it, you know, whatever, whatever you can come up with. I mean, it was fun. I mean, uh, you know, uh, yeah, my wife used to say you're never as happy as when you were doing that show and you were just getting to blow shit up on a daily basis. And it was fun. And it just did get to the point where we'd be sitting in the writer's room, just, you know, thinking thoughts like, "Hmm, I wonder what it would look like if a telephone pole fell on a car and then you'd back into it. And okay, how can we drop that on somebody's car and get some maximum destruction out of it and make that person feel like they were responsible for it? So, you know, so like I said, the first season was great and nobody really knew what was up. People in Hollywood talent wise kind of had new Ashton was doing a, you know, a prank show. Nobody knew we were necessarily coming for them. And then, you know, the show aired and all of a sudden that word is in the, in the zeitgeist. And it was funny where, you know, we go out and we're shooting the second season and everybody's immediate reaction, you know, would, when something started going wrong where they'd be like, am I getting punked? And we were just sitting in the control room going like, oh, they figured it out. And then it was like, no, let it ride a bit more. And it just became one of those words that like, that's what everybody was saying. So we just would you know, chop around that when we're cutting it. And, um, you know, I don't know, the rest is, I don't want to say history, but it was, you know, it was, it was fun. You know, could you do that show today? I don't, I mean, people, I don't, you know, yeah, you probably could. And people are doing it on YouTube, but sort of the difference, I think, between sort of the influencer version of it and, you know, people doing that is we all we had, you know, we had attorneys read through all of our scripts. I mean, in the control room sitting next to us was an attorney like, from, you know, sitting there going, we need to end this now or, you know, please don't do that, et cetera. And, you know, that was the thing, too, which I don't want to uh, get too granular it's also illegal to shoot hidden camera in California. California is a two-party consent state. Um, right, and right. when you're doing hidden camera, several states, Vegas, you know, Nevada being one of them, uh, I can't remember what the other ones are, are one-party consent states. So as long as one party knows they're being filmed, it's fine. But again, LA gets into its two-party consent. And that was sort of, I think, the other reason that it had to be celebrity centric where ultimately if celebrities aren't going to sue they're going to say please don't air that please don't put that on the air they won't say it that kindly you know people that don't have senses of humor are um hip hop artists and comedians famous athletes would be my the third so those sort of three buckets don't really like their uh their brand uh, messed with. And I mean, I recall a, uh, we shot something with a very famous, uh, athlete who 
did not like it, went back to our office with us, and we all sat in the conference room in our office uh, and took a baseball bat to all the masters. I mean, it wasn't even like we're going to erase these. And it was back when we were shooting on tape still. Um, and everything got literally and figuratively smashed to bits. Um, so, and there was a clue as to that person's identity in there. And I'll, uh, I'll let the, I'll let the people in the comments figure that one out. So, I mean, you know, but anyway, it was, like I said, it was fun. And, you know, I would say of, you know, let's just say of the a hundred bits, I would say maybe five or six people wouldn't sign, you know, um, and everybody else would. And then there was just the funny things too. Like we did a, uh, we did a thing with a, a kid named Jesse McCartney and um, I was, you know, because of the other, the MTV connection, I did a lot of business with Hollywood records and he was signed to Hollywood and uh, I'm friends with the president of the label and another person that worked there. And they, <laughs> they called me up and they're like, can we see this before you air it? And I normally wouldn't let it, but they're friends of mine. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go over, screen it for them over at their offices. And they're like, you're killing us. You can't air this. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we've spent, and I care about, you know, how many millions of dollars cultivating this kid as an artist and you're undoing it all in one, in one fell swoop. Like, just like you are destroying his image, destroying all of this. And it was like, you know, cause essentially, you know, we, uh, you know, they had spent this time cultivating his brand as being this, you know, sort of cool, whatever. And he just, was crying like a child, like a child, like went from being this tough guy to like, yes, sir. And it was, you know, it was like, ah, okay. Um, so anyway, we did re-edit that one a bit. You know, we did the that first order of 65. It certainly got a little more difficult along the along the way. Um, but it was fun too, just you know, figuring out the format for that and just sort of, you know, truly, I mean, that was the other, you know not to be the tr take the trip down memory lane but you know that was a very hard show to book if you think about it from just a booking perspective and getting people to do the show where the stars the people starring on your show that day don't know they're going to be on TV and so you're trying yeah. to get you know you're trying to thread this needle get them to the place you need them to be get them to hit the mark that you're doing and really inserting them or dropping it into a giant stunt. I mean, so, I mean, we would do car chases, we would blow things up, et cetera. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of variables there, but I mean, the first couple seasons, especially the show would air on Sunday nights and it would be Monday. We would have maybe one or two segments shot. The show always had three segments in it. And, you know, we'd be getting towards the weekend and not have a third segment. And I mean, so we, I mean, truly Wednesday, we'd get a booking in Thursday. We'd figure out the career or Wednesday. We'd get a booking. We'd figure out the creative Thursday. We would shoot it Friday. We would edit it Saturday. We would color and mix it. And that would carry on until Sunday and then ship it, you know, ship it on Sunday. I mean, and there was, multiple times, you know, this is sort of, again, pre-internet or pre did I mean, there was an internet, but sort of pre-digital delivery so that we were fibering shows and we would be fibering the third act to New York as the show was airing. I mean, it was like that sort of, you know, wet as, you know, like the paint was still wet on it as we were like shipping it off to, to TV world. And I think the fun part of that, which doesn't necessarily exist so much in TV anymore is you didn't have time to overthink it. I mean, now it's sort of, you know, you're dealing with 10 rounds of notes on a show and you're sort of watching notes at this point when you're watching TV and you're not watching whatever the creator's intention was. And that was also, you know, goes, you know, which something we get into in a bit, but goes to having really good network partners and good people that trust you. And, you know, we would get the, you know, we would get the cuts over to standards and practices, to the attorneys, making sure everybody was good with it. But our sort of the creative notes were just, the notes were always like, can it be funnier? And it's like, 
I don't think so. I mean, it's, you know, that's kind of all the funny there is. And it's like, okay, great. Then let's air it, you know, hit the funny so, button, hit, hit the, hit the button. Yeah. that just makes it funnier. Right. It's Apple F I believe. Um, <laughs> or control F for anyone on a PC. So it was, like I said, it was, you know, it was just, it was a great time and truly, you know, I mean, you know, we got a word in a dictionary at the end of the day, which if somebody had said to me, you know, you'll be part of a team that gets, you know, a word into a dictionary. Um, and then the funny part too, is it was the early days of uh, Twitter also, as I recall, like the very, very early days, Ashton was a very early adopter to Twitter and to all the social stuff, but the original spelling for it was going to be punked spelled correctly. And Ashton was just either like DMing or just speaking to some kid who was like a, you know, not even a fan of the show, but just a fan of Ashton's because the show wasn't out yet. And the kid was like, it was truly some kid in Lord knows probably the Midwest who was like, it should be an apostrophe D. It shouldn't be ED because an apostrophe D is cooler. And it's just like Ashton came in one day and he was just like apostrophe D. And we're all like, all right, <laughs> you know, like, so I'm sure that I, I hope that kid takes credit for it. And, you know, every day, you know, like, you know, I'm sure he's of drinking age now. He's in the bar. He's like, I'm the one that came up with the apostrophe D because it sure was not us old people. And I will tell you that right now. Do you have a favorite uh, prank that you pulled on punk? I have. I mean, it's. You know, I think it's one of those like asking somebody what their favorite band is or their favorite album or your favorite movie. So I, I have like four or five and all for different reasons. So I'll, I can just rattle them off really quickly. We talked about Justin just because that was sort of the one that started it all. And his reaction was fantastic. I absolutely loved what we did to Hugh Jackman, where um, Hugh thought he burnt down Brett Ratner's house. And if, you know, that, that episode or that segments on YouTube, uh, you know, so anyway, the Hugh Jackman thing is just the amount of choreography involved where they, you know, if you haven't seen the long story short, Hugh Jackman's over at Brett Ratner's house. He asks, Brett asks Hugh to light the barbecue. Obviously we've disconnected the barbecue. They can't get it lit. Brett's like, oh, forget it. Let's just go down to Mr. Chow and get Chinese food. They do that. And by the time they get back up the hill, um, the house is engulfed in flames and on fire. And there are 50 extras and just firemen. And so we loaded in all the flame bars, all the air mortars, everything, you know, all the movie smoke, all of this stuff. And I thought Hugh was going to figure it out simply because movie, you know, movie smoke smells like movie smoke. It doesn't smell like smoke because it's not really smoke i will say this that show we had the greatest art department on the planet and our art department would build and create all this stuff and in that one again i'm sorry i'm getting granular with this stuff this movie magic stuff but my you know my favorite thing about it was brett ratner's house was all cedar shingles the whole place is clad in cedar shingles our art department went to home depot bought like 50 packs of cedar shingles took them back to their shop, burnt them in a dumpster, put them in a trash can, bought, brought them over to the house, poured them down the driveway and added water to it. So it just smells like burnt cedar, you know, burnt cedar in that. And it covered sort of the lack of smell for the movie stuff and totally sold Hugh that this was real just by like the ashes running down. I mean, yes, everything's on fire, but when you smell and see the ashes, you know, that was one. Another one of my favorite ones from when we rebooted it later, um, we made Drake think he was in an earthquake. And we had been trying for the entire first run of the season to figure out how to pull off a bit with an earthquake. And finally, you know, again, fantastic art department, great writers, just everything coming together. We cracked it, figured out how to do it. And, you know, everything you could ever ask for in a bit, like you sit there and, you know, you, you think, you know, how someone's going to react and you kind of always want that person to turn to their friend and be like, I've always loved you, man. And, you know, lo we cut that out of the show, but Drake jumped into his manager's arms. was like, I love you as you know, they thought the world was ending. So that was great. That's an, and, and then, you know, those, those three are all like big giant, ones with 50 extras and you know all of this and this chaos 
My other favorite one, I think, not think, I know, is when we finally got Mila, Mila, who's now Ashton's wife, and we had tried unsuccessfully to get her two or three times with these giant elaborate bits, and she would just show up and be like, fuck you, Ashton, this is bullshit, and be like, Ugh. you know. <laughs> So again, we, you know, it was sort of this thinking, like, how are we going to do this? What can we do to make this happen? <laughs> you know, we remembered that she grew up in the Ukraine. She speaks Russian, uh, reads Russian fluently. And for, you know, there's that wonderful spot in Los Angeles that's sort of little Russia. And so we were like, okay, let's do the most simple bit ever. We got her to that sort of that end of East end of West Hollywood, um, where everything's in Cyrillic. We hired a Russian actress and a, a little girl who also speaks fluent Russian. And um, we just did a simple bit where um, Mila shows up, tries to translate, and it's the little girl's dog is stuck in a uh, sewer grate. And another, you know, Mila translates this. A another Our actor ends up getting stuck trying to do this. And then Mila realizes she screwed up the translation and it's a toy that's stuck in the sewer, not a, you know, an actual dog. And so now she has to explain to this guy who's stuck in the sewer. And it was just like super simple, but the amount of buy-in, I mean, truly it was like a two, three actors and a stuffed animal. And it's still one of my favorite bits because just she goes through the full range of human emotion of just being like, yay, I'm helping to, you see it on her face of like, oh boy, I'm not helping at all. I just made this worse to, you know, oh, I got to now tell them that I messed the translation up. So those are, I think, you know, and then, I don't know, Taylor Swift thinking she blew a boat up. That was kind of cool too. You know, they're all, they're all fun, you know? Yeah. Um, so. Those are good. Yeah. And I bet the ones like that, like, like Mila Kunis, uh, where she was determined not, to get punked were yes. more satisfied were the most satisfactory for you. Right. I think for all of us where, you know, it's, you know, we were, you know, it was like a team of misfits. I mean, we were like the AV club in high school or something, you know, like we succeeded 90% of the time, those sort of 10% where the person makes it, meaning they figure it out or the prank doesn't work or, you know, all of that, you take it really personally. And at that point we wouldn't air it, you know, and in hindsight, we probably should have, it was just as funny us failing as it was us succeeding. But I think just sort of hubris wise, we couldn't allow that to be seen. Um, and then, you know, sort of years later, like when we did the, the re, you know, we did a reboot of it where, you know, it was sort of like a Saturday night live model with a celebrity coming in and hosting it and playing, you know, guest hosting it and playing pranks on other people. Like I felt so bad for Mac Miller, like Mac came in, he was hosting it and um, every one of his pranks didn't work. I mean, we did, we just could not have failed any harder on, you know, collectively on every one of them. And, uh, you know, we, so I think those we did air, but like, you know, <laughs> we think we were, we, yeah. And that when Mac was hosting, we were trying to get Neil Patrick Harris and uh, he and his husband were out hiking and we put a bear in their car. Um, and then they just, you know, figured that out immediately. Um, I mean, it was a real bear. I mean, that was kind of cool. It wasn't like a dude in a bear suit. Like we did, you know, we did get a duplicate of their car and, you know, that was always fun. The most expensive bit, I think that we did, we, uh, and I don't want to say her name simply because I can't remember it. Some girl who's a star of a series of movies, um, some vampire movies. And uh, we she had just bought a new car, an uh, Audi Q5, and uh, I'm very proud of her new car. And uh, so, again, we duplicated, found a dupe of her car and hoisted it up on a crane, found a crane that could lift it like a hundred feet in the air and then dropped it. You know, she's like, I want my car back. And I was like, okay. And just the, there is no more satisfying sound than dropping a car off a crane and then hearing it hit uh, the ground. And I will say this about uh, our stunt guy was just had said, I could have 
been in that car. That's how well built those cars are. And like, we were expecting all the windows to blow out everything, you know, just a lot of ex- explosion or not explosions we had drained all the fluids out of it but way more carnage and that thing couldn't have been in any better shape but of course she refused to sign the release um so you know that ended up in the main titles oh as I wow recall. like we used it you'll see a car dropping but that never aired in the show because that person refused to sign a release because they didn't have a sense of humor and I mean, I guess at the end of the day too, was it a really funny bit? No, I think it was just another one of those wanting to us wanting to see what uh, a car dropped from that height looks like. So, <laughs> um, but satisfying nonetheless, um, as far as satisfying things go. You know, I think they've you know they they've rebooted it several times since, but I think it's just sort of there's that lightning in the bottle that I just don't think you can capture again. That you know, in that sort of first season of it, and also, I mean, the reality is it's kind of like magic tricks where there's only so many things you can do. You know, you can not let somebody get into a place they want to be. You can take whatever it is. You can take their car. Like there's only just so many versions of it, you know, sort of similar to like the sitcom. I mean, you know, I love Lucy did the mall. And now that's every sitcom you watch is essentially an episode of I love Lucy, which is a very dated reference. Two things. One Um, And I think this goes to kind of a larger question about content today, but kids love pulling pranks on whether it's TikTok or YouTube, but they're, they're not the big drop a car or take over somebody's house or things like that. But for them, this real, this Gen Z, very young audience, they love the fact that they're doing it as opposed to, oh, we're going to watch Ashton Kutcher or Mac Miller or Justin Bieber pull pranks. It's that ability that, oh, well, I don't, you know, back in the early 2000s, back in, you know, a couple, a decade ago, I had to watch these guys do it. Well, I can grab my phone now and I can pull a prank on my friend yeah. and get a million views for yep. something as simple as, you know, I'm jumping out of a garbage can and scaring right. the crap out of my boyfriend or out of yep. my girlfriend. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I'm envious because they don't have an attorney saying, where's the garbage can going to be? They're too close to traffic. If that person freaks out and jumps out and runs into traffic and gets hit, you know, we're on the hook for it. And I mean, so there's something to be, you know, there's something to be said for that freedom of being able to do it. You know, look, I think it's an amazing, you know, it's an amazing time to be a creator. And just the fact that, you know, like, you know, you don't, who cares at this point what it's shot on? Is it funny? That's sort of the, the the bigger metric. I respect that they don't have to go through the process of the lawyers' standards and practices, making sure they're covered insurance-wise for it, um, et cetera. All the things that you know we as professionals have to embrace and do that. But then it also conversely, you know, I'll get called to do different hidden camera shows, different prank shows, et cetera. And it's hard to compete with people that don't have to deal with the rules and don't have to, rules is the wrong term, but don't have to deal with all the things, you know, have to dot everything, you know, dot the, dot the I's cross the T's the way we do when there's network money on the line or ultimately, somebody, you know, that can get sued. And that's the thing too. We live in such a like litigious society that, you know, similar to the people that sued us on the pilot for punk like they, I think saw, I don't want to, I don't want to negate their trauma or what they experienced. I'm not trying to do that, but I think at a certain point they did see dollar signs there as was evidenced by $120 million is pretty aggressive. <laughs> For, for all they did payout. was walk in, see a fake dead body, get get freaked yes. out, and they said 120 million dollars right. just like that. But okay, but devil's devil's advocate. I, I I agree with you, but I'm just saying devil's advocate. Who knows? Maybe one of them experienced that in their life and has spent a lifetime in therapy trying to move past walking in and on a crime scene. You know, like we don't we don't know that, and that's why. We would vet, you know, moving forward, everything was vetted. And that was also why we wouldn't do things to random people that we don't know the full backstory and can't control, you know, control the blocking, control the narrative, control all of that. 
this is why I say that the digital creators and the platforms have a massive edge on us and why our our world, the legacy, what do you want to call them? Legacy media or traditional media, right. meaning the MTVs, the NBCs, even, right. even the net Netflixes of the world who require a location agreement, they have right. legal uh, appearance releases, all those things that we're required to do in advance. I watched, I don't know if you watched the TikTok CEO go in front of Congress right. yesterday, right? And he they're asking him, they're showing him videos of the milk crate challenge and the Tide Pod challenge, all these challenges. And then they're talking about kids who watch TikTok and committed suicide, all these injuries and shit. Yeah. Is he liable? Or is anyone at TikTok liable for that? Oh, people have literally gone on Facebook Live and committed mass, yeah. uh, mass murder. People have gone on YouTube and showed people dead. Is anybody liable for that? No. So like, and again, I'm not railing against big tech or anything. What yeah. I'm saying is, they're way smarter and way more, uh, the, uh, use the word freedom, their ability to grab a phone or whatever device they use and just shoot content wherever, whenever they want, while we're still trying to ask permission and the, the legal documents, as you know, I'm telling you everything, you know, get thicker and thicker oh, yeah. and thicker, the negotiations to do a prank. Could you even imagine trying to do some of those pranks you did um, when you first started no. punked now? Oh, like, no. it, it wouldn't happen. I mean, but that's also, I mean, also, you know, there's a, I mean, such a larger thing. I mean, there's also a political correctness that you can't, a lot of the things we did, you couldn't do anymore. There's certainly, you know, it, it's all evolving. I mean, I will say, you know, the problem is the internet regenerates every second, every, you know, how many million hours are uploaded to YouTube and TikTok a day, or, you know, and there's always something new and the, you know, people don't necessarily care about the production value, the releases, you know, they're not, you know, it's like the, I would say this to line producers on a bunch of show I did where it's like, we came in $5 under budget. I'm like, oh, that's great because we're airing the budget for the third act because we don't have anything else. Like nobody cares about, about that. And it's at this point, it's kind of a, a year from having an idea to it being on a TV show or broadcast on whatever streamed or live, you know, live or whatever it is versus a kid with an idea can pick up his phone, go shoot it and can be live with it within 30 seconds. And, you know, like, and I thought, you know, when we were doing punk, you know, I was talking about how we would get to, you know, whatever day and we didn't have the episode that also meant we were shooting the wraparounds with Ashton then too. And there you could be really topical and we could draft off of whatever was happening in the news and keep it really fresh and really current, you know, similar to like weekend update on Saturday night live or like the cold open where it's like, this is what's happening right now. And we were on Sunday night. So you were able to wrap up the week and that's the other advantage that these these you know that these creators do have where you really can be topical and can really you know be drilling down on you know whatever happened in congress yesterday which i mean have any of those guys ever even been on tiktok do any of those guys have kids that have been on tiktok who have shown i mean what was it one one of them called it tiktok it was like really like you're that <laughs> ignorant um it's just, I mean, it's just sort of embarrassing and appalling. I don't, you know, just, I, I use my two kids as a focus group. I have a 20 year old and a 16 year old and neither of them watch TV. They consume content voraciously, but it is via phone. It is my son. Uh, YouTube is his favorite platform and he just, you know, goes down it, finds everything I, for my daughter, it's TikTok and Instagram, but it's more TikTok than anything else. And, uh, you know, for them, there's something new every day. They are in charge of it. They're choosing, choose, choosing their own destiny. And it's weird where it's, you know, again, I'm, you know, sound like that, the, the 
one of the old dudes in the Muppet show up in the in the in the uh, balcony. I'm I'm right next to you. Sit. I'm sitting right next to you. Oh, okay. Don't well, feel there bad. we are. Yeah. Um, they're not coming back. There's nothing there for them. Like there, it is. It is in a antiquated platform. I mean, certainly they both enjoy you know, stuff that's on some of the streaming stuff, you know, some of the streaming platforms that's sort of not that everything for everyone type content. You know, it was like, it was, I worked on a project a couple of years ago and, you know, the production company brought, brought me on and we're sitting in a meeting and I was like, you know, who's your audience for this? Who's the audience for this show? And the guy looked me straight in the face and he was just like, everybody, boys, girls, fathers, sons. I'm like, yeah, then this is not going to work. And, you know, you have to get into that narrow casting place at this point. It, you know, for the longest time, it was sort of the big box retailer attitude, I think, towards content where it was just like, we're target and you can find something for everyone here. And I think now we are, especially with the advent of the internet, we're back to that place where it's all boutiques and I can go find the place that I like that speaks to me. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, that's what I was getting at. Like, you know, when I was at MTV, you know, I was there from sort of pre-internet through, you know, we're now delivering content to cell phones. And, you know, it was a very bizarre time, but in the early days, we were the internet before the internet, where it was just like, this is the music you listen to, this is how you dress, this is what you do, et cetera. And it was also the shows that really succeeded, like Beavis and Butthead, like sort of punked was the stuff that your parents didn't want you watching. And it was the stuff that's like, that's what's, you know, or the stuff that would show up in every congre- every every election year of like, this is ruining our kids' brains. The only place to really watch music videos now is YouTube, right? Right. Occasionally, I mean, you can watch them on TikTok or Instagram, but really YouTube is like the place to go to watch music videos. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's funny when, you know, segueing into making the video, when we started that show, we would not go and do making the video for anybody that is not old. It was a show on MTV that we would follow the making of a music video and then we'd pr- give do the world premiere at the end and it was a no-brainer format i mean truly like went in pitched it and they were like oh yeah we hadn't thought about that cool and it was just like you know we ended, you know again i think i did 350 episodes of that or something i mean it was like a ridiculous number um i mean just an obscene number like we were on for six, seven years, I think, which is just sort of unheard of. Like, you know, I mean, it was, it was a blast, but anyway, in the early days of that show, we wouldn't show up to do the, you know, the first question was who's the artist. And then, you know, and we had a talent department that book, you know, we do that. And then it was how much are you spending? And if you weren't spending a million dollars on your video, we wouldn't show up. And that was just sort of the thought process behind it was, with a million dollars, you're getting a good set or good sets. You are getting good wardrobe. You're getting a narrative that's being told, not just a straight up performance video. You're getting production value. You are getting all of these, you know, choreography, just all these other things that you need to expand a show out to make that an exciting half an hour. And, you know, that was the case. Like, I mean, again, all the early episodes we did were, you know, again, they've, you know, bottom end was a million. And I mean, uh, there was like a video I just saw it the other day for uh, in sync for a song called pop, which everybody says the Michael Jackson scream video was the most expensive. I would beg to differ and say that pop was because uh, as I recall, it ended up being about three and a half million dollars. Is the money on screen? I'll let other people. Uh, I'll let I'll let everybody else debate that. But I mean, that video they had every set at Sony going. I mean, every stage over at Sony and Culver was on that. They had the six big stages they built. I mean, it was bananas. And you, it's funny where you go back and watch it now, and doesn't really hold up that well. Joey had busted his leg. So Wade, the choreographer who had been dating 
Brittany and, and whatever was the impetus and the Justin or whatever breakup, his head, his body, Joey's head is just sort of really poorly comped on his body and Wade is six, two, six, three, Joey's five, eight, nine on a good day. And a very big, uh, husky dude versus you know it's just like you're sort of seeing this head not move with the body and it's just like oh boy that just did not age well and then the longer we did the show you had this sort of you had streaming music taking off this way meaning all the money had was going out of the market <laughs> and so the budgets of the videos were sort of going lower while you know the labels were losing money and the artists were losing money, et cetera. And you know, I will say, did we ever need a million dollar video? Probably not. The video music videos to me that are more memorable are like the Fat Boy Slim video done by uh Spike Jones, whereas the Torrance Community Dance Group. And it's like truly a couple of camcorders in front of a theater in Westwood. And that's way more memorable to me than. Uh, I could see 200 other videos that we did for that. And if that video costs, you know, them truly five, $10,000, I'd be shocked. I mean, pull spikes fees out of it, but I'm just saying from a production and standpoint, nothing, you know, maybe with the talent buyout, it was 20 grand, you know, so did we ever really, you know, need the expensive video? No. And I mean, also it's inherently something that's kind of disposable too. I mean, that's sort of the other the other the other thing what i will say a friend of mine just wrote a piece uh about this but it is sort of you know i do think we're in for a big change with music videos and i think sort of um arcade fire 10 15 years ago in sort of the early days of google the early days of chrome did a music video where you punched in your address of the house you grew up in and it I mean, it took all the power on your computer to do it, but it took you on this journey and using Google Earth and Google Maps, you're dropped into the video and the video would end up with you at your uh, at your home that you grew up at. I think Chris Melk directed it, as I recall. Um, and it was groundbreaking. And I think that's sort of where we're headed now, AI wise and just sort of blockchain and NFT wise, where it will become a custom experience for everybody that's watching it. And it becomes personalized and versioned for you. And that is interesting to me. That would get me to want to watch it or get me to be engaged. And so I do think what we will see in the next few years is, I mean, if you go back, check out this Arcade Fire song, which I can't remember. I doubt the, you know, I doubt the video even works anymore. Um, that sort of gave the beginning promise of where I think it's headed. And I think, you know, again, it's going to end up at a really cool place. And again, I like the custom customizable experience. And I think for the kids too, where it gives you ownership and makes you feel like you're really part of it and part of that, you know, part of the band and that they get you and understand you, et cetera. That kind of excites me. I want to ask you, you uh, just a couple couple questions just about sure. kind of where we are with the industry we're kind of in this weird mode every <laughs> network and streamer lost their ass last year now they're all kind of in a, a reckoning with we have to make money um it's as if they <laughs> suddenly they realize they have to make money now yeah. um how are you feeling about our industry right now and where it's headed you know that's a really great question. I don't want to say it's a race to the bottom um, because that seems a little, a little dire and a little nihilistic. You know, look, I think coming out of the, you know, the early aughts and sort of, you know, the 2010s, it was such an upswing if we're in, in the unscripted world. And everybody, you know, that was also when cable was still king. And, you know, you had 24 hours a day that you had to program that you had to fill. I think moving into an on-demand model, which is where we're finding ourselves, nobody wants it or needs it that the way that they did or do anymore. And you had so much bottom of the barrel. I think it's sort of, uh, I, I would always sort of we'd joke about it where it's kind of like breakfast cereal. 
where you've got like Captain Crunch and everybody's like, can agree, like, yeah, I can get behind Captain Crunch. I like that. But then you go in the grocery store and there's like five shells of like Admiral Bites and just sort of everybody knocking it off. And it's uh, kind of looks the same, takes up the same amount of space on the shelf, but you taste it. And it's, if you thought Captain Crunch was empty calories, these are really empty calories and there's just not a lot there. And so I think sort of people tired of it where, you know, you had, like I said, you know, a sort of flagship tent pole thing, then you would have everybody racing to knock it off, do the a cheaper, faster, whatever version of it that was terrible. And then you would get this third level of it. And, you know, it was just all kind of garbage. Yeah, you know, the bummer of that was it just it, it destroyed the marketplace. And it made, I think, everybody just sort of get turned off to something that was pretty cool and pretty good for a while. You know, so that being said, you had this business explode overnight. You had all of these, everybody sort of, and on an ad-based model, now that it's no longer sort of ad-based, it's now that it's all a subscription-based model, nobody needs it necessarily, or nobody, nobody wants it. So now you've got you know, more people who came up doing all the same thing, competing for a smaller pile of jobs, smile pile of, you know, careers, et cetera. And um, it's led to a lot of kind of bad behavior, just I think on everybody's ends, I'm quoting myself here, but it's become fear-based, I think this entire business. And so that you have, Networks fear, everyone at the network's fear is keeping their job. And, you know, ultimately that in that keeping their job means I can no longer take risks. I can no longer put myself out there, dare, try something different, take a risk on something and do that. For the production company, you know, they're fear-based where, you know, they're just trying to hit their financial milestones so that they can get paid their next hunk of money to keep the lights on for the production company. And so in that, everybody else who, you know, we're all freelancers kind of, we're all expendable at this point is what it trickles down to. And, you know, as a showrunner and not, it's not just me there and it, this applies to Everyone I know that are showrunners, all different ages, different different ethnicities, different races, et cetera, you know, there's no, everybody's getting tossed under the bus, essentially, by both the production company and the network just are like, you know, it's them rather than, you know, the, the network going, uh, did I give them clear direction? Did I give them clear feedback to the production company? Was was I entirely honest with them about this is the show we have, this is what we're doing, et cetera? No, and it's sort of they're lying to get their hit their milestones, you know. And you have this whole group of people who are, you know, let's just call it the freelancers of the people that make this stuff, who you know nobody's got their back anymore. And I think earlier, early on. It was more collaborative and more, um, I mean, certainly everybody was about the bottom line. The bottom line were get good ratings, get ratings equals ad sales, ad sales equals more money for the network. And the whole thing continues, you know, um, now you've got also just the streamers who I think collectively have all spent entirely overspent or spent too much money trying to build these mountains and piles of content and they're never going to be able to recoup it. So it's, you know, it's going to change. I do think, you know, if I have a crystal ball or whatever it is, I think, I think 2025 is going to look more like 1975 or 1985 than it is like 2015. And what I sort of mean by that, and I think 80, 1985 is probably a better example where I think you'll see there's only going to be like four big streaming platforms. And it's going to be similar to, you know, when I was growing up where there was, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, and then Fox came along and you had these sort of four things. I think 
ultimately that's where we're going to be is again, back into these, you know, you'll have four platforms, essentially. I think everything else will get eaten up and consolidated by the other ones, which really is exactly, if you look at in our business, what happened with the consolidation of all the production companies where you had these big Endemol, Fremantle, Tenopolis, et cetera, come in, buy up all the smaller production companies, put them under these umbrellas, you're really only dealing with, you know, essentially four content providers worldwide at this point. I think that's going to end up the same way distribution wise. I completely agree. I think it's only a matter of time before the Amazons and the Apples start to buy up the smaller yeah. ones. That's well, all. Disney will just Disney yeah. will fold into Hulu. They'll put Fox and all of those properties underneath them. I mean, it's they'll do. I think everyone will end up following the Discovery, Warner, HBO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it, the bummer with that too is, you know, and I'm sure you do too. I have friends that work at all these platforms. Yep. And what happens is, you know they go from being really overworked to incredibly overworked. And I mean, if you just sort of look at most TV shows now, at least, you know, alternative wise, you know, the network gets five, six passes at it notes wise, and that's for each episode. So in order of 10, that executive's having to give 60 rounds of notes on a show on one season of it. And they now have 10, 12 <laughs> shows that they're having to do that for collectively. Um, there's just not enough hours in the day. And at that point, you know, truly when you're watching TV now, you're watching notes and it's like, they're not even really good notes. They're kind of notes for notes sake at a certain point. And certainly as creators, yeah, we can push back and say, you know, what's the spirit of this note? Or, you know, what do you really mean by the music sucks, which is my favorite note ever, um, <laughs> you know? Uh, and but, they're not the only people giving those notes. There's, no. there's a, a lower level executive and then there's yes. the EVP or, you know, the high level executive who has to sign off ultimately. Yeah. So there's always multiple executives now. So yeah, five, six rounds, multiple people as well who have different visions of what that show should be. Which well, is that's, a great, that's a great point you bring up. What's lacking is a consistency of vision. And that's where, you know, shows like, you know, again, first season of True Detective, written every episode, written by one person, every episode directed by the same person. So you had this consistency, like a feature film across the whole narrative and across the story. And, you know, there's another example of something that wasn't noted to death. Whereas when you're watching dumpster divers, you know, I don't know, like whatever <laughs> show like that, it's like, I don't know. I didn't feel enough dumpster diving in that episode. Could they come up with something better? Like, uh, I don't even know. I did so. a dumpster diving show, Billy. One of the, well, it was memorable. Let's just say that. You you don't forget the smells. Let's just say that. You do yeah. not forget the smells. Not to speak for you, but hopefully I am. I think what attracts us to this is the collaborative nature of it and is working together and, and group problem solving. This, you know, television and most creative stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. It is not one person sitting there doing it. You know, it takes a group of us to do it. And we, you know, for the longest while, all supported each other, all lifted each other up, all helped each other achieve this. And you need a great team to, to do this. And you need the support of your peers. And, you know, as this is, you know, as the business is imploding on itself, as the tech industry has sort of taken it over and gutted it similar to, I mean, no different than the way like Elon's gutting Twitter, you know, like sort of cutting it to the bare bones. Everybody's kind of in self-preservation mode. And I think it's just, you know, remembering that we all, you know, that we all need to remember to kind of look out for each other, have each other's backs and support each other. And, you know, we're, ultimately all could be in the same place at some point. Yeah. Agree. hundred percent. That's yeah. what I, um, that's what I value the most is those experiences being on set and working with my colleagues 
Um, you know, I remember the first time I got back on set after, you know, the, the heart of the pandemic yeah. and how much I had missed being on set. Like you don't, you forget how much you miss just that, that collaboration and just the, the camaraderie that you have with your fellow creatives. All right, dude, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome, man. Great meeting you. Likewise. Before I go, I want to comment really quickly on the Barbenheimer phenomenon. And after two weekends, Barbie has made over $350 million and Oppenheimer has made over $170 million. Props to everyone who worked on these films. Now, as both studios and the entire town starts to dissect how they pulled this off, I encourage everybody not to overthink this. It's not rocket science. Both films had incredible writer-directors, amazing filmmakers, Greta Gerwig and Christopher Nolan, right? Both had large, attractive, recognizable, and popular ensemble casts, right? And then the marketing, right? That was everything, right? The marketing, whether you're talking about separately with Barbie or you're talking about together as Barbenheimer, right? These two films became an event, right? It was a moment that you had to be a part of. It was something that you wanted to go experience with other people. And that's rare now. You had to go, you wanted to throw on pink or get a photo in the in the Barbie house or you were reliving some sort of childhood memory that you have, some connection you have to Barbie, right? Or you wanted to kind of be a part of that fervor online and, and, and post a TikTok, or post an Instagram. And that made it special. There was a reason to come back to the theater. There was a reason that you didn't want to wait to, for either of those movies or even just one of those movies to watch it on streaming or on cable. So it's great to see that, that both those films have, have done so well. And look, I, I, I hope that others follow in that path. All right, that is going to do it for another episode of the No Script, No Problem podcast. Uh, please support those writers and the actors. For everybody listening, please remember to subscribe, download, and rate the show with five stars. It's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Audible, and TuneIn. You can also find it at Believe.com and at Believe Podcast. Follow me on Twitter and post news at Steve Berkowitz and Instagram and threads at Steve M. Berkowitz. You can also email any questions you have to no script, no problem podcast at gmail.com. If you're interested in advertising on the show, please contact Believe at Believe.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Steve Berkowitz for No Script, No Problem.